Hey there. Um, so <clears throat> rule of thirds, let's sit to the side here and look over this way. Um, let's talk about realism. So the first concept here for the first few films is using motion pictures to capture reality. Uh, you wouldn't even think of it today because you're so used to it. Uh, but there was a moment that we had no idea what it looked like when a person was running. And uh, there was a moment when the governor of California, Leland Stanford, uh, wanted to know what it looked like when a horse was running. So a famous photographer named Edward Muybridge uh, recorded a horse running. If you went to the movie Nope, uh, you saw images of this horse and a new mythology was created about the rider, that he was the grandfather, the great grandfather of the people in the film. I'm trying to remember how to do all this stuff. Um, but but let's, let's see if I can do a screen share and figure out how to do this. All right, so I'm gonna do a screen share. I'm going to share Chrome. Okay, let's see. Okay, here's Chrome. Can you see it? I hope. And um, here's the link. So the first film by Moybridge. So you're going to have to use this film link folder. Oh, not this one. We'll watch this one next. You're gonna to have to use your film link folder to find the films and get the concepts. So this is the first film. So uh, Aid Weird was really just filming with still cameras. He had trip wires set around the ring and the rider and the horse were riding around the ring. And the issue was, is there, I swear to God, I just muted this, didn't I? It's muted, right? It's the other thing that's playing. All right, so at this moment, let's see, wait. At this moment, the horse is in the air. So training a racehorse, trying to win races, uh, he didn't really know if there was always a moment when the whole body of the horse was resting on one of his legs, one of his hooves. Um, and so he wanted to film a horse running. When a horse was galloping, it's running so fast you can't see it. So you just don't know. Uh, so he hired Moybridge to film the horse going around the ring. And it's an amazing artifact here. It's perfectly lined up. Um, so all these single cameras are, are, are set up around the ring as the horse ran. It's tripping a wire that's taking a single shot. And then they went through the single shots and they realized, wait a minute, when you run these together, it's motion. And our eye basically puts that in between motion together to create um, motion pictures or movement on film. There's a little bit of a stutter to it, but not really that much. So this is what we consider to be the first film, the first breakthrough and the realization that we could take still images, uh, line them up and, and make a film. Uh, there have been a few other people who were using plates of glass. Um, a guy named Jansen wanted to film the motion of Venus across <laughs> across the sun. I think it was the Venus was eclipsing the sun. And so he used glass plates on a rotary uh, camera. It was called like a Revolve Photographique. Uh, Moybridge, still cameras, filming a horse running around a track. And then eventually these two men in France, uh, Pierre and Auguste Lumière, Lumière means to light, so kind of, an interesting name for people who are gonna make film. They uh, convinced their father to turn their family factory in a town called Lyon into a camera factory and to make motion picture cameras called cinematographs. So the cinematograph camera was designed to film using, oh God, now I, I'm, I'm mute, aren't I? No, this isn't me. The cinematograph was designed to film um, motion. So the first thing they filmed was the workers leaving the factory. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see all these workers coming out of the factory in this image because many of them are women. There's a horse in there. There's a dog in there. They should think, 
you're so used to thinking factory work was done by men, but look, look at all the women coming out of that factory. So these are the factory workers who made the first cameras in a factory. Uh, the Lumieres walked outside and filmed them coming out of the camera. The Lumieres really imagined that the movie camera would not be used to make big entertainment uh, films, but to make home movies, just to film people in their everyday lives. Let's see if there's some other ones in here. Well, this is all just the workers leaving the factory. Here we go again. All right. Um, they filmed, you can see the other uh, Lumiere films uh, through Canopy. Oh, here we go. Here's the La Cieta. So this is what your first chapter you're going to be reading about is about uh, the the train leaving La Ciota, La Ciota station, copy. And here it is. There, there's a um, kind of a mythical story that when the train came into the station here, people were so freaked out. They thought that the train was gonna run them over and they all ran out of the theater. It's not really true. It's kind of a good story. So it's just people getting off a train, you know, 1896. You know, 130 years ago or 125 years ago, uh, what did people look like? What were they doing? What did they wear? You know, it's an artifact of history. It's realism. Uh, the Lumieres were not saying, okay, now you guys get back on the train. Now get off the train again. They were putting the, the camera down and they were filming, reflecting reality. So some of the first questions we ask about filmmaking is, is this reality? As somebody who comes from a history of filmmaking uh, more than film watching, you know, I started teaching this film studies class about five years ago, but I've been teaching video production and filmmaking at Duchess for 20 years. I know that a lot of filmmaking has to do with um, uh, reenacting things. Uh, so you're going to read in your book, this is the book, you're going to read about Nanook of the North. And well, there's some criticism of Robert Flaherty that he was reenacting a style of fishing and hunting that was no longer practiced in the Hudson Bay region. So um, he had gone up there uh, the turn of the century as a miner. And then he realized, holy crap, you know, these people are living the way like our ancestors lived maybe a thousand years ago, maybe 10,000 years ago. Uh, and their world is changing rapidly. I should film this. I mean, there's new technology. So he went to Bell and Howell in, um, in New York State, I think in Rochester, New York, uh, and trained with them on a camera. He learned how to film. He learned how to uh, develop the film. He learned how to uh, edit the film. And, uh, and he went back up there and he began filming. And a lot of it was, you know, what you would do if you were just on vacation somewhere, you're filming people doing this and people doing that, and editing it together and just being like, here's what people look like up in uh, Canada. Uh, and he came back, he was editing the film and he smoked, everybody smoked back then. He dropped a cigarette on it. And at that time, um, film was very flammable. It's made with cellulose, plant material, uh, with a coating on it that, that can make it very flammable. So it all caught in flames, he got burned, he ended up in the hospital and um, his wife was there with him and was, oh my God, you know, I can't believe you lost everything that you were working on. And he said, you know what? I think it's okay. I'm going to go back. But when I go back, I'm not just going to be on the outside filming like a tourist. I want to find someone to show me and show the world what it's like to be an Inuit person in the um, Hudson Bay region in Canada and, and what it's like to hunt and, and you know, ha what it feels like living in an igloo. Um, and that's what he did. So uh, by the time he returned, you know, it took him a few years to get money to go back. You know, he only needed about $10,000, which is, you know, about how much we might need to make a movie like that. Uh, you know, it's funny. There were times when the cost of filmmaking went way, way up and then way, way down. Um, but these are hand crank films. There's no electricity. Uh, there's uh, really no light. They're using reflectors to reflect light. Uh, and the main source of light is the sun. So you won't see a lot of nightscapes, you know, a lot of stuff that might look like night because um, it's not bright enough to make it look like sun. Uh, and uh, he went by himself. So I think there's sort of this feeling, oh, well, the crew must be staying in a hotel somewhere. 
there's no hotel. You know, there's no electricity. There's no radio. There's no television. Um, the, these are basically camps where Inuit people live, you know, in small family groups and communities. And then, you know, there are fur traders from France and there are, uh, you know, people going up to look for uh, mineral mining. But for the most part, uh, there's really not any kind of modern civilization. There's no cities yet. So uh, Robert Flaherty was traveling with the Inuit people. Uh, he was filming them hunt, filming them fish. And, you know, he basically met this man named Alakarialak. And he said, hey, I want you to play. I want you to be the hunter and I'm going to film what your life is like. You know, what it's like to hunt a seal and a, um, a walrus, catch fish. Uh, and by the time he returned, gun, you know, Inuit people were trading fur for guns. So they, they did have guns and probably they would have maybe been shooting a walrus with a gun. You know, I mean, people don't really shoot walruses with guns, but, you know, again, so there, there's some criticism that by the time he returned, he was filming someone doing something that would have been done 10 to 20 years earlier. To me, that's not such a radical difference. You know, I live in the country, I have a wood stove, you know, um, I do have electricity, but, uh, you know, I mean, some of us live more traditional lifestyles and, uh, you know, we don't, you know, just because the world has changed a little doesn't mean we change. But anyhow, so in some cases, he's having Nanook reenact things. Uh, I think much of the film is pretty damn close to reality. I mean, he's catching a fish. That's a fish. It's being pulled out of the water. He's catching a seal. That's a seal. Um you know, their, their dogs are fighting, there's snow. And the only crew involved in making this movie, Nanook of the North, uh, is Robert Flaherty and the people who are in the film, the Inuit people. So, you know, you're, you're seeing Nanook, you're seeing uh, his wife or a woman, a couple of women, some children. You know, there are definitely some other people around them. And some of those people are the ones who are holding a reflector and holding the camera. But these are all Inuit people that are helping Flaherty make his movie. So I like to start this class. You know, initially when I started this class, I thought it had to be movies. It couldn't be documentaries. But I see uh, Nanook of the North as sort of the seminal work of it's halfway between a documentary and a movie. It has a character. The character over overcomes obstacles um, and uh, doesn't have a script. It doesn't have costumes, um, but it it has a story. and. Um, but it's also very much, in my belief, a documentary film. It's documenting a time, a time when things are about to change radically. Um, and uh, and what it's like to be in that place in that moment. So the first film that you're going to watch is Nanook. And you're going to use the film link. You're going to use Canopy to watch Nanook. And think about reality. Read the chapter. Uh, and think about, is this realism or is this not realism? And again, and whose perspective are we seeing the film from? Are we really seeing what it's like to be Nanook? Or are we still seeing Nanook from the viewpoint of someone coming up from the modern world? I mean, the modern world from 100 years ago um, and looking at Nanook as an outsider, maybe as an oddity, as as sort of a, a, a character from the past um, who's still alive, you know? a living artifact, uh, or is he a person? So, you know, and I, I don't think there's a right answer. I think some of it is how you're gonna perceive it. So this is our first film. You know, we watch these few little clips thinking about how they make film. Then we're gonna watch, the, our, uh, Nanook is the first feature documentary film. Uh, it's, it was a very unique film that came out. So it's, it's unique now, it was unique back then. Uh, when it came out in 1922, all the distributors in America, like, people don't want to see guys eating raw meat. Give me a break. But uh, when it played at the Ziegfeld in New York, it was big and people loved it. And when I was a kid growing up in the 60s, we still watched it at assembly. Everybody in America knew who Nanook in the North was. And to a certain extent, you know, this is a film that might have, uh, you could say, promoted colonialism. Uh, uh, Alaska was not part of the United States when this film was made. So you could say that to a certain extent, Laity's showing a part of the world that America was starting to think about, hey, we're going to take a chunk of that, you know? Uh, eventually we wanted Alaska. We wanted to own that piece of land between uh, uh, 
Russia and Canada. Um, and, you know, we're going to be thinking a little bit of, of film being used as a tool of colonialism and film being used as a way to uh, fight colonialism and establish independent nations. Um, so I would say, you know, Nanook, a little bit of tool of colonialism. Um, and you think, well, Alaska is part of America, right? Well, you know, it might not have been. It could have been a native land that belonged to Inuit people and native people that lived up there. But at some point, the United States said, hey, let's turn that into a state and take all the oil. You know, that's colonialism. Um, I mean, you can say they have agency and representation because they're a state. I'm not programming you with these ideas. Uh, watch the film and see what you think. You know, my 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 opinions shift a little from, from year to year. Uh, so we're going to be using this term a lot, colonialism. Uh, and this is when, you know, oftentimes powerful European nations take over other countries, take their resources, and oftentimes justify it by saying, well, we're, we're bringing them Christianity. We're bringing them culture and education and medicine. Like a lot of these countries may prefer to have their own way. So something to think about. Uh, the cinematograph camera, um, when the Lumieres made it, it was something of a tool of colonialism. So the French, you know, we don't think of the French as being a huge power, although they're doing pretty good in the World Cup. Uh, but um, the French controlled uh, some countries in Western Africa, Cameroon, Senegal, um, Algeria, which we'll watch the Battle of Algiers this semester. Um, so they had holdings all through Africa. And when, when the colonialist nations, you know, were running a country, people from France would be living down there, living very well, usually with servants. And, you know, they were, they were basically kind of, they would just come in as the government and the rulers and the elites and the people who own all the companies. And then they would send all their resources back to their country, but they were far from home. So the cinematograph camera uh, ended up being shipped to a lot of these colonies, uh, to India, to Algeria, to, um, you know, Australia. You know, you think of Australia, oh, Australia is part of the Commonwealth of Great Britain. Well, you know, it didn't have to be. There were people there before the British got there. Uh, it wasn't always a penal colony. So, so there are places where indigenous people have lived uh, you know, and then there's there's been this idea when the Europeans arrive that it's like, well, people just arrived here. <laughs> Nobody's here. Uh, and and the Europeans uh, usually arrive with writing. And oftentimes the writing that they arrive with is uh, deeds to the land. And it's like, oh, I have a piece of paper here that says I own all this land. Uh, since you guys don't write, you don't know what it says, but it says that I'm now the boss. It's a big part of uh, colonialism. Uh, William Penn, you know, got Pennsylvania for his birthday and then came to Pennsylvania and told the Lenny Lenape people, you know, I'm going to let you guys stay here, but uh, it's my, it's my, it's now my place, Pennsylvania. Um, so the first camera was something of a tool of colonialism. It was a way uh, for the colonial rulers, the, 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 colonists in places like Algeria, Senegal, India, uh, to send back images to the home country, to Europe usually. Uh, it was a way um, for the home country to send films to India, the new crowning of Queen Victoria, and the terribly important things uh, that the English had to share. Uh, but eventually those cameras could end up in the hands of native people, in India especially, very early on. Um, Indian filmmakers started using cinematograph cameras to tell their stories rather than telling the stories of uh, the colonists and telling stories that had more to do with magical realism and illusion. Okay, so, but this is my first, my first uh, talk here is gonna be on this idea of realism. Uh, tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more about illusion, but uh, there's a PowerPoint for everything and then I'll try to also do some videos. All right, how do I stop recording? Stop.